<laughs> who has power, who should have power, who's giving out that power. There's a lot more that goes into it than just erasing bad guys. The superhero thing is a joke. You cannot collide the ideal with reality. How do you fight for a country that's never fought for you? Sometimes people need to see blood for it to get real. My seat just got really hot. <laughs> What is that power to you? I was like, I'm just gonna go ahead and create something over here. Welcome to a special edition of Another Act where I have the pleasure of sitting down with the talented cast and the genius Marvel masterminds of the Falcon and the Winter Soldier. I think we have to start at the end of the last episode. You know, we spent a lot of time examining what the shield means as a symbol in this show. And it feels like we just tore all of that down. I'll start with you, Kevin, but this one is for the group. What does the symbol of Cap and the shield mean to you? And what does it mean to flip that on its head? Well, what, what was interesting to explore and what Malcolm really was, was talking about was it means different things to different people. And I think to Sam in the early part of this show, it's connected to the man that held it before, uh, right? And I think to Bucky, it means something else. And it's interesting to see in the series when people disconnect it from that and think it just means anyone can hold it. And that doesn't go so well as we saw in the last, uh, in the last episode. Malcolm, I want to bring you in on this one too, since you really are instrumental in flipping uh, the entirety <laughs> of what, what it means on its head. Uh, what, what does that mean to you? And, 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 and what was like the motivation for you and kind of reimagining what that meant for everyone? Building off what Kevin said and having a minute to think about it while people were talking, it really is about it meaning different things in the hands of different people. Like as I progressed from reading the Marvel comics to then the M, you know, getting involved with the MCU just as a fan, it's so much about Steve. It's so much about the guy who can pick up Thor's hammer or go up against Thanos, even though. Technically, he has no business in that battle, but that spirit and what he embodies when he's holding it. Mm -hmm. And then when you sit down to take on this project, you, there's no way you can hide from the fact that the second Sam picks it up, it also means a lot more than that. And I think that sort of organizes the entire series is, you know, if a black man from the South is holding those the, the red, white, and blue stars and stripes, yes, he feels the specter of Steve because that shield is so dominant in the MCU but he's black first, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Nate, how about yourself? You know, Steve Rogers to some degree was the ideal, not of America, but of, of doing the right thing and, and, and always having the best intentions. So whenever, as soon as you put blood on the ideal of something, I think that's pretty powerful, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think everybody in the show is, is struggling with the ideal because the ideal is not the reality anymore for Sam, for Bucky, for John Walker, for Carly, uh, for Sharon. Everybody's trying to reconcile the notion of the ideal with reality. And the reality is, again, as soon as you put blood on that shield and, and you see it in the fans reaction, there's a visceral like, you can't do that. Like you cannot, you cannot collide the ideal with reality because they, they're incongruous. They, they, there is a dissonance there. I think in terms of the blood, it's like, again, the reality, you know, sometimes people need to see blood for it to get real. Um, mm. Even though many people have already known that that was a factor, but some people are oblivious until they can't be oblivious to it anymore. Yeah. Zoe, how about yourself? Oh, well, I think it's been said very eloquently so far, but I think to add to it, it's in its best form, it's about being the best version of yourself. And the danger of that is what any given person will do mm -hmm. along the journey to try and achieve that level of greatness. So to me, it's it, again, what everyone said is it, everyone is going to react to that pressure differently. Either it's going to bring out the best parts of you or the worst parts of you because, you know, it's at its core, it feels almost unattainable. Emily, how about yourself? Well, I think it's interesting from Sharon's perspective anyway, um, because when we met her originally, she was so all about the shield, so idealistic, such a sort of young, vibrant young agent. And then we see her now and all of that idealism has dissipated. Really, Sharon's kind of turned her idea of the shield and of superheroes in general and what all of that means and what that represents. I mean, it's turned on its head for her. She's completely cynical and jaded to the idea of what that is. She even says, you know, you know the superhero thing is a joke. 
it's inter- it was interesting to tap into that perspective, which was totally different from the Sharon that we originally met. And that kind of taps into everything that we're talking about, which is these different perspectives that are so unique to that individual. You know, for Sam, it's a, it's a constant battle of how do you fight for a country that's never fought for you? Um, and when Steve is holding that shield, the, the, the humbleness, the, the resiliency, the uh, beauty of the human being that he is gives the shield a completely different meaning. But when, he, when he's taken away, that symbol is something that's far more reaching and, and, and far more scarring than the idea of just red, white, and blue. For Sam, in many ways, the one thing that held up the uh, moniker of that shield was the idea of um, who Steve Rogers was. You know, seeing a U.S. agent killing a civilian broadcast to the world on cell phone cameras felt like a very 2021 moment, unfortunately. The shield effectively, as I think we were supposed to see it at the audience, could be interchangeable with a badge. And I wanted to know why it was so important for this series to make this type of social commentary in the world that we all find ourselves living in. Um, I wanna go around the Zoom on this one again, but I would love to start with Nate on on this one. In its best version, the show is an interrogation about what it means to be American and what it means to be patriotic. Uh, And especially to Anthony's point, from Sam's point of view, what does that all mean as he's trying to struggle with the mantle of Captain America? And the, the truth is, the sad truth is, these are images we see in our everyday lives. And we wouldn't be truthful storytellers if we didn't confront those, those ideas, you know? Mm. Um, as a Black man in America, that is something that I'm hyper-conscious of, and I think Sam Wilson is hyper-conscious of. And while I don't think our intention was to rip from the headlines what is happening, I, I do think thematically, it is sort of interesting to interrogate that idea and figure out how then do you reconcile this, this thing that, again, is the symbol of the ideal with the reality of, of how sometimes it is deployed. You know, Sam Wilson and, 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 and uh, Bucky Barnes have to kind of get their heads around if, if indeed there should even be a Captain America moving forward. I think Nate touched on something that's really important because, you know, I, I can't help but sometimes read comment sections on tweets or whatever, right? And I think people think you show up, they, when they see those moments, they think there was an agenda there and you know just building off something nate said about being honest you want to make the best series possible and you want to tell the best story possible and the messed up thing is that scene in that moment is inevitable if you're trying to tell a good story you cannot escape we would it literally would be it's the same fans who might be like oh man this show is really woke would be like oh they deliberately wrote around an obvious moment that would have occurred you know what i'm saying and that's the that's the that's the hard truth of it and i think that's the amazing opportunity that we have you know telling these kinds of stories and marvel letting people in to be part of the journey and evolution that's going on is that the storytelling and hero movies is going to evolve with the times you know just like everything else and that was just that was an inevitable moment you couldn't escape it yeah. Kevin, was that kind of um, a directive that maybe you gave your team when it came to shaping the story is that you really wanted to hone in on that? Or was that something that happened a, a little bit more organically as you guys got into the writer's room? Well, it was a it was a combination. But as we set out to do a Falcon and Winter Soldier show, we, we were certainly looking at our films, uh, The Winter Soldier and, and, and a little bit Civil War as the more grounded level, right? We had been to space, we'd fought Thanos, we'd blipped away half the world. What would that really have been like for for half the population to disappear and return? What would that be like? It would be extremely difficult and extremely complicated. Just like when an old man, Steve Rogers, hands Sam Wilson a shield, it's a big moment, it's a proud moment, but it's a lot more complicated. And the notion of being able to do a Disney Plus show and bring in people like Kari and Malcolm is to explore that complications. And that's where the honesty that Nate was talking about really, really came, came from. At Apero, you know, your your character delivered just some lines that just, whew, you know, you kind of feel it a little bit um, everywhere with, with the regards to the social commentary. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because in some cases, it really felt like, I wouldn't say ripped from the headlines, but more 
more the imitation of, of what our real lives are actually like. What was that like for you as an actor bringing, bringing that to life? I think, you know, Nate and Malcolm and Kevin, everyone's touching upon, you know, the, the truth. There's, there's no way to tell the story without speaking the truth of what it is and the truth of, of, of who I am and, and how I see, you know, how I see everything. I remember sitting in the theater watching Endgame. Before I had any involvement in any of this, I was watching. And, and the moment that shield was handed to Sam Wilson, I was like, mm. you know, there was that a visceral, like, you know, it wasn't, a, it, it, I didn't spend a lot of time on it, but it was just that, you know, and I was like, this is going to be interesting. And, you know, and so for a character like Sarah, you know, she's viewing her world in a certain way and she's able to connect what's, what she's seeing, how her people have been affected, her community has been affected to America at large, which I think a lot of us are doing. I mean, last night I was kind of, to be quite frank, you know, I had work to do, but I was in a funk because I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about what's happening in the news and I'm just <laughs> exhausted, but also I have things to do and I'm exhausted and dot, dot, dot. I don't know, I don't know what else to, I don't know what else to, to say, but it's all around us and we can't ignore it. Yeah. But I don't know that these stories are new. And I think that's the point. Is so that we were drawing on what is and has been happening and historically is a norm, which shouldn't happen, obviously. But I, we all could tell the same story three years ago, five years ago. Now, you know, we're seeing the story converge with, with um, the news and events uh, in that sort of, you know, very heinous way. What we always try to do with these stories is be as honest as possible about how these very hyper real heightened characters would exist in our world. And I think that's why people connect to them so much because we really come at them from being humans first, even the ones who have abilities or, you know, heightened wings or, or arms, you know, at the end of the day, they are humans at their core. And we also seek to really champion the voices of the writers and filmmakers that we bring in. And so, for example, Malcolm coming in and saying, here's what I'm drawn to. Let me tell you some stories about my experiences and how I connect to Sam Wilson as a character. That's when we knew like this was all meant to be. This was the right story to tell because it was connecting with Malcolm as a writer and therefore would connect with the audience, you know, as human beings watching this. Wyatt, <laughs> you have you have uh, quite a, a task ahead of yourself when kind of bringing to life this character that is maybe changing, you know, how how we view this iconic superhero. What's that like for you? I, I know in a very real world, uh, since you probably are playing the character a little too well if social media uh, has something to say about it, but, but talk to me about, you know, really kind of exploring these uh, very real life themes that, that are happening and, and coming across um, through your character? It's simple in a way, <clears throat> in that when you look at the character that you're playing, no matter what the character is, from a place of what would this guy do and what would this guy feel like? Uh, when you look at his background, which is, yeah. you know, it's important to look at someone's background, you can see why he thinks what he's doing is right. He's been trained by the government for a long time to be a killing machine. That's what they train them to do. So when he's been thrust into this position as Captain America, it's not something that he necessarily chose to do. It's something that he was chosen by the only family that he's known in a long time, which is the US government, to be able to perform his duty. So when he goes and does these things, in his mind, he's saying, you, I'm hired to kill bad guys. I'm not thinking about the moral ramifications of what I'm gonna do. I'm just doing it. He's, a, he's robotic in that way. And that's what raises these questions of, well, if you're going to be Captain America, you're going to hold that shield. There's a lot more that goes into it than just erasing bad guys from the planet. It doesn't work like that. So in John's version of that, in his mind, he's not entirely in the wrong. And that's what I think makes 
interesting characters is when they end up thinking, wait a second, how are you making me feel like I'm wrong? I'm just doing my job. And there's an aware quality to him uh, in the world that he's now living in, where he was sort of living in a, in a, in a world in the past that he wasn't scrutinized in the way that he's going to be scrutinized now and that we're watching him have to figure that out and deal with that. The, the reason I'm so anti um, uh, John becoming the Captain America is because he doesn't have that same humanity, that same dignity prowess as Steve. Like prime example, in New Orleans, John wouldn't be a bad guy. He would be known as throw it off. Like he just a little bit ain't right, you know? He's okay. He just a little ain't right. So in New Orleans, he would be thrown off, you know? So <laughs> it's not that I don't like him or I think that he's bad or awful human being. He's just put in the wrong job. Yeah. Uh, so when that moment happens and, and Sam sees that, because there's been many times that the shield has been used as a weapon. This is just the first time it's been done in a way where it's a public non-superhero setting. And, you know, in the Marvel Universe, when there's blood, the blood, you know, 75,000 people die every movie. But the, when there's blood, it is a, a, it is a real thing, you know? Yeah. So yeah. It, it's, it's used for effect. And I think yeah. that that moment was meant to be effective on many different accords. And the, and the blood on the shield kind of magnified that in a great way. Anthony, Sam's reluctance to take up the shield um, feels like it's driven in part by his respect for Steve Rogers, but how much do you think his blackness factors into that decision in your eyes as you obviously play the character? Uh, well, his, his blackness is definitely a part of it and a huge portion of it. I mean, it, mm -hmm. it starts with the idea of it being um, Steve's shield. You know, at the end of Endgame, I said, it feels like it's someone else's. It feels like it's yours. There's a soldier admiration and respect of brotherhood between the two of them that was very important to him. You know, he's a, he's a counselor of soldiers. He's, he's a, uh, you know, a man of his word. So, you know, a, a lot of it, a lot of the idea of his, of his, of his blackness as an American man, his, his blackness in his day-to-day -day reality, his blackness with the family and the history in which he's come from, but mm -hmm. his relationship with Steve played a big part in it also. Yeah. You know, John Walker was introduced as Captain America in episode two with what feels like an HBCU band as his opening act and a Black sidekick. Malcolm, how did you want to emphasize the roles of Black people in America through the lens of this series? It's funny. Um, I do want people to know <clears throat> the collective of that room mm -hmm. is was so fertile and vibrant at any given moment. I don't even remember. Someone else pitched that band, right? Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. it was born from the spirit of what was already happening in that room, you know what I'm saying? And it was a nice mix. I feel like if you get enough black people in a writer's room, it starts to go in a certain direction. Like everyone gets to absorb it um, 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 and, and be born from it. But like, we was never unaware of characters who were people of color, specifically black. A good example is how much attention we paid to like what Lamar is doing. You watch Lamar's relationship with John Walker, at every moment, it is his point of view is a black person's point of view, you know what I'm saying? His awareness mm -hmm. of how all this shit manifests when you get outside of what the dominant mainstream, you know, people are is, is apparent and it's consistent going down the line. Um, Sarah coming from the background that her and Sam come through is immensely powerful, opinionated, and important to Sam. It's fun, they love each other, but you can tell from watching their relationship that at no point was she ever signing off on stuff that she didn't feel like was right for her boat. And so we, yeah, we, it was important for us to portray it the right way. And, and I think the thing I'm most proud of is how everybody in this creative collective followed those threads. I'm telling you, the easiest thing to do is watch Lamar because, you know, and watch how he responds to given moments. You know, John breaks bad after being beaten by the Dora and his comment, they weren't even super soldiers, 
and the decision to take the serum all lines up with the inherent desire for supremacy, as Zemo calls it. That's an interesting line to walk in a franchise built around superheroes. Uh, Zoe, I want to start with you. What are your what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, you know, I think that's that is sort of the point of view that Zemo brings to the series, which mm -hmm. is he doesn't believe that super people should exist because he believes that that level of power can only lead to supremacist ideals. Mm -hmm. And obviously we've seen that proven untrue through characters like Steve Rogers, but that is sort of the central question of the show is like, can you have that power exist in this world and not have it go hand in hand with the same moral fibers that Steve held? And so each character is kind of grappling with that because everybody has motivations and a lot of them are, you know, completely understandable or come from a place that is, you know, rooted in their experience and something that was initially good, but, but what does that power do to you? And does it potentially corrupt good intention? Along those lines, without giving anything away, of course, Isaiah Bradley's storyline from the comics falls very much in line with Zemo's comments about the ideals of supremacy and super soldiers. Kari, Kevin, is it? Okay, Kevin, over to you. <laughs> <laughs> My seat just got really hot. <laughs> I think it is true, and I think it's I think um, uh, it's one of the great things from the original comics that Isaiah Bradley was in. I think that's one of the reasons that Malcolm was very vocal early on about including Isaiah in this show. And I, I was always a big fan of that character, but frankly was nervous about not being able to do the character justice by just having him be a, a small element of it. Uh, of this show and he's not and thematically he he sort of is the show which Malcolm of course knew and was right on about and yes that ties into to many of those things who has power who should have power who's giving out that power and I do think what makes our heroes at Marvel superheroes is not the power it's the ability to wield that power responsibly or as responsibly as possible and if you go through the difference between the heroes and the villains in so many of our stories the heroes are the ones that have had power thrust upon them or accidentally been given them or uh, looked at it as a way to overcome something as Steve Rogers did. And the villains are the one who actively seek out that power, actively desire that power. Yeah, you know, um, there's so many themes I think you can extract and in many different ways you can dissect what this series ultimately is about. But one of those things, feels like uh, a direct answer, I think, to the quote unquote fans who have something to say about colorblind casting. Is, is this in some ways a direct response to the idea that the representative of this country has to look like Chris Evans and not Anthony Mackie? Yes. I mean, I think that's what we're saying. That's what, you know, Sam Wilson says, I'm putting the shield away. And, uh, and a, a white senator says, good decision, son. That, that's a good decision you made there. And next thing you know, it's on TV. Here's a blonde, uh, blue-eyed uh, white man get, getting it. And whether that was conscious or not on the part of the people that made that decision within the, within the, within the government of the story, um, it, certainly, it certainly is making a, it's making a statement. I just do want to say, as Malcolm said, I occasionally make the same mistake of reading, uh, of reading comments online and what Wyatt uh, went through in, in a week after his debut uh, and people going, who is this? Hashtag not my cap. This is terrible. Hey, this is he's horrible. This, I hate him already. He's not done anything. And what I've seen recently is really almost a almost an awakening online of people going, wait a minute. I hate his guts, but that means he's a good actor. Oh, what? <laughs> this, this actor is creating this performance to get this emotion out of me. He's the best. He's great. <laughs> so I think that was quite a quite a fun uh, four week journey. Uh, why? <laughs> That's why he's got a beard, though. <laughs> he's hiding. I, I overstand that. <laughs> like a mountain man on top of a mountain. Going, oh, my God. I was on a show, uh, some other show, and they were like, you don't look like Captain America. You look like Camping Man. <laughs> camping Man is the superhero we all need right now, probably. You know, you know the, Marvel, the Marvel team has really created this world where we're watching all of these shows that play off of films and the next films will in turn play off of these shows and, and on and on. Obviously, without any spoilers, how do you see these characters growing from this series into phase four and beyond? Or with spoilers, of course, if you want to break some news here. 
let's ask yeah, Kevin and probably. Nate. Let's right. Let's ask Kevin and Nate that question. <laughs> well, it is you know yes without without spoilers, but the uh, idea was to go back and forth that we weren't creating two classes of storylines or two classes of productions. And I think now that people have seen Wandavision and and four out of the six of Falcon Winter Soldier and the trailer for Loki, they're seeing that these are these are A-class productions just as big and just as important as the movies. And we do have plans to go back and forth. We've talked um, very openly about, um, I'm here in, in London on the set of Doctor Strange 2 for our final week and Lizzie is here having worked nonstop from wrapping WandaVision to stepping right into uh, Doctor Strange 2. Um, and, and yes, we do have plans for uh, for some of the characters as you see them grow and evolve in Winter Soldier to go uh, to go off into the into the future, but we're not quite talking about that yet. Okay, I have my predictions, but I'm keeping to myself. But I think I'm right. But I'm keeping to myself. Thank you guys so much for doing this today. This was a lot of fun, and thank you for gifting us this fantastic piece of content during what has been a really last crazy twelve months. So thank you so much. I appreciate you all. Thanks, Kelly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, y'all. Yeah. Bye. Bye.